Right, and gang, second part of the series. Again, Carol, thanks for coming, mate. We're here at the Body Lab in High Street, Kensington. And what we're going to be deciphering and talking around is sort of what's the mission of the Body Lab, what problems their customer base has because their customers are very corporate athletes, athletes and people that are sort of into the high performance and wellness space. A little bit of cow story. So, Cal, I'll let you introduce what the the first question was basically: what built the body lab, and and why is it here? Yeah, uh, I think you know there was a huge gap in the market um, pre pandemic. It was just really gyms, um, and not even wellness centers. You know, there were flotation centers, there were cryotherapy centers, but there was no, nothing that was ever really amalgamated into one. Um, and I think one of the USPs of the, of the body lab itself is the synergy that we tried to create between performance and recovery, uh, and then combining that with the nutrition piece and, and, and lifestyle. Um, so there was just, there's, there's such a need for it in, in, um, in the sector that it, it, it just made so much sense. Sure. There seems to be, as the years have gone on, it used to be such a, a polarizing topic of just athleticism was performance. And then anyone else was just general population where now I feel it's a, it's very different. I feel high performance are for people that actually have a specialization and that can be physical, that can be vocational, that can be super specific. And I feel, I think now the science has come a long, a long way. Guys and ladies were seen in the previous episode about, about all the recovery modalities and the sort of the depth of knowledge of why it's there, the application. Having that all in one place is, is geared to build the ultimate corporate athlete loose term for someone who wants to elevate their performance, right? Yeah, I mean, we use the term life athlete here. Um, we've all sat at home and, and watched uh, watched some sport and watched some TV and be like, I want to be like him. And every, everyone everyone has the people that like, I watched a lot of basketball. I want to be like a lot of these NBA yeah, athletes. Yeah. And being able to bring that to literally the high street yeah, is yeah. on the doorstep of people. And it's accessible and it's exciting and it's new and it's, you know, it is a new shiny toy. But mm -hmm. that new shiny toy that you can hold can also optimize your life. Sure. So it, 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 it brings the kind of training aspect of what people are all used to and then entangles them in the whole idea of recovery and nutrition and the holistic have, side of performance. Yeah, basically. we have an osteopath here. We've got a blood nurse to look at blood panels and we partner with Randox next door to use those blood panels. We sit in a practitioner meeting once a week at 1 p.m. on a Wednesday and we sit with the osteopath, the blood nurse and all the trainers and we discuss everyone that has come through the doors, be it my client who has seen the osteopath and I regularly sit in on my client's osteopathy, sure. um, osteopathy appointments because, you know, it's a common thing in the PT world and I'm sure you've seen it is whereby your client gets a knock or an injury and they're like, okay, so what did they say? And they're like, oh yeah, something in my back. I broke, bit, I broke my back. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you've got no idea, but right. like I sit in and watch him ultrasound wow. uh, my clients and do manipulative techniques and not mental manipulation, but <laughs> physical. Uh, and and I, I, I look and watch and learn and understand everything that he does. And then I implement that into the program and training. So then we also have the blood nurse who comes and shows us the blood panels and what we can do to change things. Because we as trainers, you know, we entrusted one of the most important things in the world and that's people's health. Yeah, and yeah. I feel like too many people in this space take the Michael and 100%. abuse their power and don't fulfill their client's needs by caring about what their client wants. All sure. they want to do is to fulfill their ego and knock out a number. And that is not what we want to do here. No, and it's 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 ever present right now with the world of social media. Hence mm -hmm. the reason why having more of a deep discussion around it's been always been my ambition with what with our channel and what we do is because I've always been taught seek to understand then to be understood. And especially when you're dealing with I've always also been taught around your blood doesn't lie. And when you're dealing with people who are pushing the needle of life and they have a huge environmental pressures and people that are doing more um, things that aren't generally the norm in relation to volumes of work, volumes of training, ambition, challenge, the detail matters. Yeah. And, and I think something that we, we don't have as much as coaches is being having the opportunity to, to leverage skills of other people. Like the amount of times you've been in a coaching session and someone's divulged information that is not in your wheelhouse, you'd, you'd give it to a psychiatrist, but the amount of times as a young PT, you're like, oh my God, I've got to take this on, I've got to look after it, rather than we work with an NLP coach. Um, and I, I'm obviously NLP trained as well, so it's learning those, those, those things is massive and also so nice to see from a coaching practice standpoint because it's very rare. Sure. Most people just Instagram it. 
yeah. and figure out stuff. We, we can talk. That's a whole another episode about talking about what we can find on Instagram. But what 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 do you find? Uh, if if you were to give three um, the biggest problems of your of your corporate athletes, the people that you work with, and what sort of when they when they first start at the body lab, what's the main things that you see, and how do you actually help them? Lifestyle. Um, you know, you have a huge amount of people that travel, yeah. um, events, uh, and then obviously the, 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 the lifestyles that they're leading lead them down to pathways that, you know, they go to the best restaurants and they have the best wine and they yeah. have the, a the great, bouche, man. yeah, 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 yeah. And why, 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 why would not? you turn it down? Yeah, why yeah. would you? And also there's part of it where they can't turn it down. Of course. That's what I find. I found really difficult when I was in, working out in Singapore was your boss flies in from New York and he points you in the face and goes, listen, this deal is worth this much money. You will eat what they tell you. Mm -hmm. There is a high expectation and it's, it's easy for people who, who haven't got that level of expectation to just go, mate, I, I don't need to be having a tomahawk steak with buttered greens and, and, butter, and chips and wine and all the good stuff on a Tuesday afternoon. Yeah, but I guarantee you, if you're taken to the Hawksmoor or one of these bougie restaurants, yeah, absolutely, where no, it's yeah. all laid out in front of you, you're not you're going to turn around and go, no, sorry, no, sorry. I want to die. Have a fish, or, please. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no. is that steamed broccoli? Yeah, steamed broccoli, or not. yeah, no. So definitely. So what what would be your your sort of integrated coaching process around that? What what's the main principle that you try and give somebody in that position? Because that's something that's massively prevalent with both our demographics and people that will be watching this. Is is how do you help them find balance with it? And I obviously, with all the the, the bells and whistles that the Body Lab has, which is the, those are the obvious things. But from a coaching process standpoint, obviously you've got your leading young coaches. I'd be interested to hear more around what sort of, we we call it high impact behaviour. What's the main thing that you try and help them systemize? High impact behaviour or low low hanging fruit. Yeah. Um, I, I I see. You know, you, you've got to really grab at your small wins and make those move into something that you can really with these people it's very difficult to keep them engaged when they don't see change because sure. with their lifestyles and the way they they lead their lives the now results yesterday it's all, yeah, yeah it's all about now so if you can figure out where you need to go with that person it's obviously very very individualized to that person but for me where i'll look is their lifestyle if you have a day where you're going to go out and you're going to be entertained by clients, go. And you need to go because you need to go need to, perform. to pay these bills too. Mm -hmm. So, but when you have a down day and when you don't have any of that, take it as a complete down day and use that as a way to modulate your diet in the best way possible. Increase your hydration. Make sure you sleep. Make sure you train and use that day. And don't look at, a lot of people get so micro-focused on their diets. Your diet is something that you shouldn't look at on a daily basis. No. You should look at it over a very long, very long in training terms, I would say is three to six months for me. Mm -hmm. I would say that I know that in six months, for me, if I stick to a certain calorie range, and I'm lucky that I understand and know where I need to be for my body, is that if I stick to this amount of food per day for six months and I have 25 to 30 days that I'm not really going to do it properly, I know that in those six months, I'm going to see changes. Yeah, yeah. And it is trying to show them that you're not going to be perfect all the time. Nothing is perfect all the time. No. The, but these people want everything to be perfect all the time. So you have to show them that imperfection still leads to success. And being able to get that with the small wins of making sure they sleep, making sure they eat well, and making sure that you know you look at your calorie you don't look at your finances on a daily basis you look at your finances as a monthly section right and if you take your diet and your calorie intake as a weekly or maybe a monthly thing if you say that you've got 30,000 calories that I'm just making up a number yeah, yeah. if you say you've got 30,000 calories to eat in a week that's a lot that's a lot <laughs> I'll take I'll, I'll that's take 30,000 calories and that's, that's a bit too much more for breakfast bro. <laughs> right yeah. let's go let's go a little bit let's go 15,000 calories so if you if you if you dial it down to 15,000 calories on on Friday Saturday and Sunday you know that you're going to be doing two thirds of those calories yeah. there thereabouts so on your Monday to Thursday you need to understand that they need to be the days that you need to to, to focus on and really impact because Training, in my opinion, is not about restricting yourself, making yourself feel shit, making yourself starve, making yourself not do things you enjoy. It's about augmenting your lifestyle for you to be able to do those things and still enjoy them without feeling guilty. Yeah, yeah. It's the 
the common analogy of, of, of people that would be utilizing training as an escape mechanism or a purge mechanism for negative behavior yeah. rather than something that which I, I can tell by your, your coaching staff and by, by what the body lab does is performance is about thriving and thriving has been used in a in a terrible way in my opinion because there's a very big difference between actually seeing progress and talking about it we the individuals that you'll be working with and that we work with as well a massive on they have an all-in mentality whereas actually it's about which is got them so far I, it's not it's, that's not a negative thing the thing about an all-in mentality means you win or you lose whereas daily optimal performance is about being in the gray area of the 80 percent we we i coach all of my clients to be just like factories are built to work at 80 percent capacity because they know they've got 20 percent when they need it if they go more than that they're under pressure if we take someone's training phase and like you said from a lifestyle standpoint they've got they've got a family dinner or a 40th or whatever and they're in this all in i will not eat that we're actually the whole point of all this is to find connection within the process so like you said is having those days where they can have the push and pull of actually you i used to remember when i used to go my old man he worked in he worked um near soho uh, he's an advertiser uh, and then he worked various places sam shouts you, you works with sam's dad um he on the weekend we talked about nature before there's there's a there's a, uh, there's a um a woods near Beaconsfield. I used to go there and it used to be off barbecue back to analog back to then that built that connection piece for him to go off and be corporate. So yeah, it's, it's very interesting to hear that, that that's the, that's the, the understanding of what you guys are doing. Cause it's very similar to mine. It's like performance is encompassed in everything that we're doing. And it's not about this unless there is a caveat, which we should, this is a, a talking point is, I talk around optimal performance around health because you want to optimize everything. Peak performance is very different for athletes. They have, they've got to peak for competition. They've got a peak for, I work quite a lot with fighters. They've obviously got fight camp and they're obviously going for a, a pinnacle. The thing that I find interesting is trying to bring that down a step for, for normal people that haven't got that. Like you said, training mechanisms in training and strength and conditioning, we want them to get fitter, faster and stronger. Whereas we're not, trying to they're not going for a powerlifting meet you've got a joe blogs here who's a corporate who's who just wants to feel good feel strong i think it's it's, it's a superpower to know the difference between that and it sounds like you guys do that already in relation to the, the backroom of the high performance behavior that you have and recovery but what i'm interested to delve a bit deeper and a bit more about you Me. Uh, but yeah yeah here we go let's go deep yeah oh but i want to know i want to know because obviously you're you're leading a young team and you have your own philosophies of training and you're clearly very versed in all the aspects that we love and talk about on our program. What, what built Cal? What was your? Interesting. Um, yeah, I, if you asked me 10 years ago, or if you told me 10 years ago, that'd be a PT, I'd tell you that you're lying. Yes. Uh, I, I went through uni, um, did sport and exercise science, uh, and then went and worked as a sports, uh, sports, scientist for AFC Wimbledon okay. uh, in their academy um, and kind of thought, you know what, this whole one-on-one -on -one thing I actually really enjoy uh, and then got a job uh, um, down the road at Equinox. Uh, yeah. That was kind of my first PT gig. Uh, I was there for five years and then the pandemic hit and then the, the opportunity as a freelancer came up here. Um, and I've always been a PT that has just been I've never specialized in anything. Mm -hmm. For me, uh, as a kid, I played every sport under the sun. Uh, there wasn't a team that I didn't want to be in and didn't play for. And, and I just, it didn't matter. I just loved it. It, it didn't matter what, what sport it was. And I feel like I've moved that over to what I do as a personal trainer in a sense that I don't specialize in any specific sure. piece because... I realized quite early as a PT that, oh wait, if I go down this pathway, then I'm, I can't, yeah, I can't, yeah. I can't train everyone. No. I'm, I'm reducing the amount of sure. money I can earn. Yeah, yeah, and no. also the experiences that I can have, you know. And the problems that you see. Yes. Because we both know strength and conditioning or, or, or science-based training in any nutrition, whatever, it's all metric driven and it's all, if I do this, I'm gonna get this outcome. If I do, if we do this exercise, I'm gonna see this result. But then when Karen turns up and she's had a fight with her husband, got three kids, not slept, not eating anything, not hydrated, and 
she actually just wants to, she needs to recover, but you've got a plan where it's like, she's absolutely dropping the hammer on this assault bike. The visual doesn't match the audio. And it's super interesting because I think a huge talking point that happens with our industry right now, especially with PTs or coaches that are trying to go, like talking about going online, because let's face it, there is a piece of this where people are all jumping the gun. I'm a massive, you have to coach in person before you, you cannot travel, you cannot go online before you've been in person. But the rise of the generalist, I, I have, I'll how hardly tell anybody, I've built my whole career in person and online from being a generalist because I went down the strength and conditioning route. I, I played professional sport. I had massive injury and I worked with physios and then I became a nutritionist and I've done all these certifications, but then I saw a huge carryover. And it's super interesting to hear your thoughts on why coaches need to be a generalist, not just for making money because it is to make money sake let's be honest most people most people that come from a sport science background their first ambition is like mate i'm literally going to take a dude to the olympics yeah. or i'm going to work yeah. in professional sport yeah, 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 and yeah. then they get into professional sport and they've got absolute average cash they're working crazy hours and it's actually out of your control because the the athlete i had this when a friend of mine played it did it in professional rugby if the athletes aren't brought into the strength and conditioning process, but they don't perform, you're the one still getting. Whereas PT, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on, obviously you've come from a really niche sport background, but then you zoom straight back to the, to the generalist. If you were speaking to the younger version of you, what would you say would be, why would that be so important? I feel like it just broadens my knowledge base and allows me to experience more. And I really believe in that as a PT. I feel like maybe it's partly my I, inability to just be stimulated by one thing in a sense that if I was delivering bodybuilding sessions over and over and over and over again, I would <laughs> hate it. And I feel like I love the variance in my training. Like one morning I'll be doing animal flow with a client. The next morning we'll be, we'll be deadlift, I'll deadlift with another client. The next morning I'll be hand cleaning with another client and then I'll be doing a bunch of rotational stuff with a golfer and I'll be looking up a bunch of exercises because oh I play I play golf so he plays golf so I want to find out because I want to use it and then yeah and at the same time because you're a generalist as well one of my big 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 mantras as a coach is that you cannot program or coach an exercise that you have not religiously done yourself and experienced Amen. and I see so many people doing that it's like, if I turn around to you, it's like, Will, uh, what was that bungee like? Did you go, and you're like, I've never done a bungee. So how the hell are you going to tell me what a bungee is like if you've no. never done it? No, no. So, and I see so many people programming and doing this. And I want to be able to program these exercises. And I want to be able to understand them and learn them. Because everything has a purpose in the gym. If you can just, I don't care what exercise it is. If you can turn around to me and justify that exercise to me and convince me, I'm like, Go, uh -huh. knock, yourself, knock yourself out. Yeah, yeah. If you can justify it to me and I know you can coach it, go ahead. So I think there are, but there are a lot of people like you were saying in the online, online, which is why this industry is becoming very difficult for people and people to find other PTs, sure. is that people are just going on and like reading stuff like, oh, that's an exercise for the hamstrings. Right, we're going to do this. Okay. Or worse, they're going on Instagram with some weapon. Just, or <laughs> mate. I, 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 it's so refreshing to hear. I totally agree. Is is one thing... I think this encompasses all high performance, but especially with coaches or others that are looking to do anything that that works with people is there is nothing, zero uh, exercise or anything better than exposure. Not exposing yourself, exposure to training. So the 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 premise of if it, it, we, the, the bodybuilding analogy, I, I see so many PTs and coaches get out in who who used to be bodybuilders who are now in terrible shape because they've got no other way of training. And they, they've suddenly hit the 30th cycle of, of their training block that they've done for 30 years. And they're, they're not dying anymore. They've now got kids and they've got, they can't have adaptive training. Whereas if we took the examples that you just mentioned, animal flow, deadlift, hand clean, golf rotation, the, the spectrum of, 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 of what you can do with someone also gives you freedom to periodize somebody to have optimal performance. And it's sort of, it's all a self-feeding narrative of yeah. that. We talked around um, the upward spiral of performance of the issue with performance is performance is mastery. It's impossible to finish. Whereas peak performance is a bit different. Peak performance, I think if someone hits peak performance, 
there has to be a push and put. There's like a we have a, an eight week flush and then we go right. We have to pull back here because you're going to hit, hit a roadblock or you're going to break or whatever. But super interesting to hear that you said that 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 generalist piece is something that I would massively endorse young coaches or people who. I'm people will know I'm I'm into BJJ, every ex professional rugby player, speed and power. I went did an Ironman last year purely because I coach Ironman. So it was, I'm 97 kilo fridge with legs. Yeah, I don't know how yeah. you did that. No, no. Well, my lung collapsed. Yeah, it, it did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't worry. But I still made it. I've got the medal. Don't worry about it. Yeah, I made it. I haven't got the Ironman tattoo yet. But, <laughs> but I'm going to get it on here. But the point of that was purely for the same thing. And I think that's something that's massively, massively important in our industry of people not just getting lost in finding likes and being a clown on Instagram, but actually to be a coach of substance or somebody who can back themselves and have, we've got such a confidence issue in our industry of people that have got imposter syndrome, they, they lack confidence. They, it's because they, you build confidence with courage and courage is putting your hand up saying, mate, I have no idea, can you show me? Correct. And that's, that's the, the biggest thing that I find is difficult in our sector are uh, being vulnerable. Oh. And being, I'm not. It's not down the mental health route because that's that's a whole different thing. But as a coach, yes. you, to be to put your hand up and say, I have no idea. But do you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go find out. I, it, it's the most powerful. I thing still do that once a week now. Literally, I still do that once a week. Even with the osteopath, with the dietitian, with everyone, like I don't care if I'm wrong. I don't. I don't need to be right. I just no. need to know what's going on. And if that means that I have to turn around and say, Yeah, I'm not sure. And to your point as well, like. Life's like a garden. You don't mm. end where you stop. Mm. And if your client turns around to you of, of three, four months, five months, six months, or two, three years, and says to you, yeah, I want to change my training up. And you're like, oh, I only do one type of training. What's going to happen? You're going to lose a client. And then- Or the, they get injured. Yeah, and I saw you see, yeah. Oh, and I see, I see, I used to see leads coming into Equinox all the time. And you're looking at leads come in, and he's like, oh, okay. The, the leads were distributed based on oh, the, the, the personality of the trainer and the qualification of the trainer. So what? So if I've got one qualification, then it means that I'm only going to get one type of lead. But if I've got five qualifications... Then what? Makes a difference. Mm, mate, it, it's, so, it's funny how this doesn't seem to be rational, mm -mm. even though it is. Mm. And that's, that's something that I find such a polarizing thing, especially for young people coming into the industry. Like I, I work with young coaches who are... Who are want to be better coaches i'm not this business mental mogul that's like the 11 and a half word email that's going to make you a million pounds dude i'm not that guy i'm the kind of the, you want to build coaching quality you want to actually understand the career and you actually want to better yourself to better other people you've got to have skin in the game and that that comes from doing the stuff that you talked about we talked about before about the million hours of pt the amount of times you're in the gym the amount of times that you're just hanging around asking people cleverer than you to tell you the layman's terms to help you with your coaching process, that's massive. I mean, the last bit I'd like to you to elaborate on is something that I'm very passionate around for coaches is to give themselves a, a bit of reflection of like, if someone was to ask you, what was your superpower? What would your superpower be? Uh, I, I'm a bit of a chameleon. Uh, I was actually having a little chat with a, well, I was talking to a mate when I was I was out visiting him in, uh, in Portugal in August. And we were at his daughter's one year, uh, one year old birthday. Um, and we're outside having a chat and a, and a bit of a drink in the sun. And he was like, mate, do you know what? You're one of my only friends that I think I could just drop in a party and you've never met anyone and just leave Bosh. and let you go. Yeah. And I think that I, I do that with work as well. You know, I, I want to learn. I want to talk to people. I want to understand what's going on. I want to be able to be adaptable. And um, a friend of mine who I used to play basketball with at uni, his, his, one of his mantras was adapt or die. And that is true through so evolution, right? Yeah. So I, I feel like my, the, the superpower that I have is just, is just being a chameleon and trying to blend in anyway. You know, I want to be able to sit and have a conversation with a mom about her baby that just fell off the chair and has bashed her head. And then mm. I want to be able to have a conversation with a guy who's in finance under high pressures and looking at stock markets and then have another incredible interesting conversation with a 24 year old kid who's just coming out of studying and being able to do this and wants to play sport and and just experience and push myself into every realm that i can learn from because awesome. you know we're not we're not here for long and no. the more you can soak up the more you can enjoy the more you can appreciate the better your life's going to be and i think if you can take that in and out of work 
it just it just gives you an, a three dimensional look on things. That's so good. Nah, mate, that's wicked, mate. Thank you very much, man. This has been mate, a pleasure. I think yeah, we could yeah. have chewed each other's ear off for two and a half hours. Yeah, I think so we could have. Yeah, we'll do that next time. <laughs> nah, thank you so much, man. Like I said, I'll link everything up for social media and Body Lab and yourself. If anybody wants to reach out, where would you say for them to go? Uh, we've got a website and we've just launched an app as well. So thebodylablondon.com. Oh, wow. We've just launched an app too. Awesome. Um, come down to High Street, can and see us. We're only a couple of hundred meters away from the tube station. Um, and we have our, our own social media page too. Awesome. Pleasure. Thank you very much, man. Yeah. Anyway, gang, I'll catch you guys soon. Thank you very much.